And we are scheduled to start, so we will do that. Uh, just so that everyone doesn't realize that Mr. Roth will be taking over at 5.30 if we're not done. Is that a threat? That is a threat. <laughs> if any long-winded discussions go on tonight, you'll have to deal with Bob at the end. Yeah. All right. Ms. Garcia, phone roll call, please. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock, Sean Wood. Chrissy Panganello, Anthony Graves. Robin Kniech. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Libby Zabo. Casey Ty. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Larry Vidham. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Aaron Brockett. Ann Justin, Lynn Baca, Rex Bell, Tara Radloff, Jeff Blue, George Teal, Jason Bauer, Doris Trular, Carrie Penaloza, Laura Christman, Eric Holan, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates. Here on the phone. Thank you. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Carolyn Scharf, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey. Here. Scott Norquist. Here. Sarah Shakaris Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, TJ Gordon, Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton. Here. Shakti. Here. Jerry Bean. Isaac Levy, Phil Cernanek, present. Win Shaw, here. John Peck, Gabe Santos, Ashley Stolzman, here. Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, here. Deborah Jerome, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, Jordan Sowers, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Heidi Williams. <laughs> Eric Montoya, Herb Atchison, yeah. Joyce J, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Okay. Rita, you don't have to put up with that harassment. I want you to understand. <laughs> I don't know if we have a long enough meeting tonight. <laughs> There's a process a for that, Rita. Yeah, we have a process for that. Yeah. Okay, moving on. The summary of the March 1st board work session is attached to attachment A. Any comments, questions? We don't need a motion on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board of directors. Or there anyone in the public who has a comment that they'd like to bring forward tonight? Good. We'll move on. Uh, first item up, attachment B, Mr. Calvert, discussion of initial evaluation criteria. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there is a copy of staff's presentation um, in your packet. I will also give you fair notice that we're going to have some discussion questions later that are also um, in the packet in, in that presentation. So if you want to cheat a little bit and, and, and move ahead to kind of understand what we're, when we put you on the spot, uh, what we're going to put the put you on the spot about um, that might be helpful. So I'll load up our presentation here, and we will also later be using these little clicker things, which hopefully everybody has one in front of you. If you do not have a clicker in front of you, just raise your hand and get our attention. We'll make sure and bring one to you. We do have a few folks, maybe at least one person on the phone, and I'll explain later how we're going to get you engaged uh, using um, the clickers um, as well. Um, so I'm actually largely going to be co-presenting um, tonight with um, Andy Taylor on, on my team. Um, Andy gets the hard part of the presentation. I, I think I get the easy part, uh, the intro and the uh, uh, conclusion. Um, this is really a continuation of an item that you all started really in March, but I think it's gone, it goes back a few months um, as well. Um, you know, we're going to share a little bit of analysis that builds on um, the conversation in March, but also uh, way back in um, August of last year at your workshop, there was a request of information related to how the, the region is growing and ultimately converting land uh, to urban uses uh, throughout the region that 
there's been a lot of work on our end, including some conversations with your uh, technical staff to get to an approach that makes sense to share that information with you so you actually be hearing um, about that um, as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are going to use the clickers in a little bit, but I, we do have kind of a plan of attack for how to um, also get input from people that are, that are joining uh, remotely. Um, some, a very quick kind of uh, overview of, of the timeline. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, we came to you in March um, to, to gather some initial um, input about how you would evaluate um, a coordinated growth management um, initiative. Um, you may or may not recall um, one of the things that happened um, relatively late in the development of the MetroVision plan um, was a conversation at both the board um, and amongst uh, your staff um, about um, the current way that the, that, that the plan uh, treated uh, our urban growth boundary, urban growth area program, and really just sort of recognize that maybe we need to have a conversation about is that still the right tool? Um, if so, how can we amplify what works best uh, with the current program, or do we need to think about um, some other approaches? And so we really are following through um, with that directive um, from, the, from the MetroVision plan. Um, as I mentioned today, we're going to uh, provide you with some uh, analysis that really is um, responsive to some uh, questions that you've asked um, in, in the past. And then, and as I mentioned, we will have some polling questions later that really will help set some parameters for staff. Um, we fully anticipate working on this um, project over the next couple of months, but we really we need, we need you all to give us some parameters, set some guideposts as to what success might look like um, from the board's perspective, and then our hope is that we can spend some time working with your staffs to ultimately come back to you with a proposal or proposals um, about what a regional growth management initiative uh, might look like. It could be the UGB program that exists today. It could be that with some modifications, it could be a different approach. Really, we want to hear a little bit from you all to help us um, be able to put something in front of you um, to evaluate what those proposals um, might, might look like. Um, back in March, uh, we shared uh, this map with you, and it kind of sparked some di discussion, which we thought was actually really quite helpful. Um, if you recall, this shows um, sort of growth areas looking into the future. Like if you take our forecast, when we forecast out to the year, uh, 2040 and try to understand where population and employment growth is happening um, in this region. This, this map in, in broad strokes um, uh, shares that information. Um, while we do, obviously, if you, if you remember, we are experiencing significant growth in areas that are not largely developed to urban intensities today, uh, we're also seeing a significant intensification of places that you would always th already think of um, as urban. Um, but, but that was very much a forward-looking um, conversation. So today we're going to share a little bit with you that's maybe more a timestamp of today and also um, looking back to, again, to help um, um, give you some information to, again, give us a little bit of parameters to help us understand going forward what you are hoping to get out of an initiative that, that really connects local growth aspirations with, with regional planning assumptions and what the region is really going to look like um, going forward over the next um, 15 or 20 years. Um, so Annie will largely pick it up um, from here. Um, you know, really what, like I said before, um, I'm hopeful that what we're doing is pairing some information that you saw previously in March that was forward-looking with a look back um, on the past few decades uh, with really kind of a, uh, trying to answer, if not conclusively, at least maybe pointing to some things that maybe are indicators that kind of look at this question or statement that's on the bottom of this slide. Yes, as a region, I think we all recognize that we are, we are, we are growing very rapidly, and we have grown very rapidly in the past. We are really trying to answer the question, does it look and feel different um, 20 years um, uh, forward from when really the last time we had a conversation about that shared um, growth management um, uh, legislation? Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, uh, to Andy to kind of hit you with a lot of facts, figures, maps, charts, et cetera. So please um, don't be shy about asking questions. We looked at a, we did a lot of analysis. We obviously tried to get it down to really kind of a, a conversation that we thought would be most helpful. So please feel free um, to ask questions so that we can make sure that you really are, are understanding what we're putting forward in front of you that, that really hopeful is helpful for we hope it's helpful for the conversation uh, you have at the conclusion of the staff's presentation. So I'll turn it over to Andy Taylor. Andy um, is a planner on, on my team and is also really kind of the point person on our current um, urban growth boundary area program. So when your staff is really has questions about where, where you are on UGB, Andy's the person that they talk to. So he's, uh, he's very familiar uh, with, that, with the program that we have um, in place today. 
All right, well, um, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, so as Brad mentioned back in March, uh, the map we just looked at, we were looking um, uh, forwards in time. And so I've just got a few things uh, looking backward on, on some of this follow-up analysis. Um, we're just going to focus on two main points. Um, the first is that in terms of jobs and population, our region is booming again. Um, this might be somewhat of an obvious point to make, uh, but we wanted to put this growth in perspective with, with some of the the maybe more recent past, but maybe look out over the uh, past 30 years or so um, and see how it might look a little different. Um, but we also wanted to focus on what might look a little different this time around. Uh, and this is largely based on some of the feedback that we got uh, in the March uh, work session. Um, and we want to see, are there potentially any lessons to learn as we move forward um, with a revamped or, or, or new uh, regional growth initiative? Uh, so let me orient you to a little bit about what you're seeing here. Um, we looked back for all the data points uh, going forward. We tried to look back to 1986 whenever we could. Um, here what you're seeing is the, the change every year. So um, this is what the region added or in some cases subtracted every, each year in, in, in these different data points. So in other words, if it's above zero, um, the region was growing in that area. So these are three related data sets. Uh, you're looking at uh, changes in employment in blue. Uh, you're looking, which that also helps uh, drive migration, which is in, in green in the upper right. Uh, and then that also is related to the need for more housing, uh, which you'll see uh, on the bottom in orange. Um, some things to point out here, um, the employment chart probably shows with most dramatically um, the, the different uh, periods that we've gone through uh, in, in over this time. Um, you see uh, three distinct periods of growth. Um, you also see two uh, recessions separating those, um, the, the dot-com recession of the early 2000s and the Great Recession of the late 2000s, which was spurred by the subprime mortgage crisis. Um, but there's uh, an interesting period also uh, in the mid-2000s. You can see um, where we weren't really seeing that much in migration at that point in time. Uh, but we were near our peak for, for adding housing. Um, and, and, but uh, any inventory we may have developed during that time is, is likely gone um, uh, since migration levels are continuing to rise um, and housing starts actually still remain below um, that, that mid-2000s peak. Um, and another thing to look at there with the, um, the, the migration uh, chart um, is actually that we, we experience more out-migration than in-migration as a region. Um, leading into that that growth in the in the 90s. Um, another way of looking at, at the housing that we've been adding over this time, um, housing starts are actually remain uh, lower than than during um, some of the past uh, booms that we were just looking at. Um, in recent history, we've built um, significantly more single-family dwellings than multifamily, but um, coming out of the most recent recession, multifamily has actually kept pace with single-family. Um, multifamily is near its earlier peak, while single-family construction remains below its earlier peak. So um, to try and get back to the question of where this growth is actually happening, um, we bro we've broken up that, that look back to 1986 into three uh, equally sized periods. Uh, what you're looking at is a, a heat map. The, the darker the spot, the more ac construction activity uh, there was related to housing. Um, comparing the first chart to the second chart, you can actually see many more uh, spots of intense activity spread throughout the region uh, in that second period from 1996 to 2005. Um, Comparing the second period to the most recent, it's actually really hard to find some of those new hot spots. The areas where we are still having some of that single family uh, construction activity are largely in places that we had already seen some uh, during that 1996 through 2005 period. The multifamily picture is also uh, fairly interesting. Uh, just a quick data note here, multifamily is, is any structure uh, where we have more than one housing unit associated uh, with that, that structure. So it's somewhat dependent on, on how the county assessor aggregates their information. So what you, you might see here are some, some duplexes or other attached single family product uh, in this, this multifamily category. Can you take a question? Sure. 
Particularly relative to the uh, multifamily, do you split that data out between multifamily for ownership versus multifamily rental? Uh, we do not. This is strictly from the assessor's data, so um, we are we are simply looking at um, we compile that data. How um, we often don't know. Not your fault, but how right. important. Right. Uh, we can look at it in the census data, but we don't have that same geographic picture with it. Um, and with this, um, I mean, there's been a number of articles. I don't know if your data gets into it, but um, uh, it, it seems that uh, some of that net migration, the housing level hasn't kept pace, and so that uh, what we're seeing is more households with unrelated adults. Yeah, it, we, we don't necessarily see it, but we suspect um, based on just a really low vacancy rate um, with, with housing, just that can barely keep up with just churn. Um, uh, there, anecdotally, we hear those same stories about you know, families doubling up or things like that. Okay, thank you. And so um, one of the interesting things I, I, I found between these three periods um, was, was that second period, that 1996 through 2005 period, and that more recent period, 2006 through 2015, um, where we're growing um, in those areas of intense activity have, have um, they're, they're more concentrated in, in specific parts of our region, yet we've actually had more um, units being added um, over that time period. So getting back to um, how the, the UGBA initiative sees this, um, we can try and talk about how, um, uh, where, uh, in terms of the abstract <coughs> language of the UGBA, um, what we were just looking at, just looking at data and, and, and heat maps, is a bit simpler because we weren't trying to make any classifications or other uh, definition-driven determinations about growth. Uh, it was just purely looking at where that residential growth happened. Um, the closest corollary to what we were just looking at uh, in the UGBA initiative uh, is what we call extent of urban development. Um, sometimes you'll also hear uh, me or, or Brad or, or others of us call it a footprint as well. Um, so the extent of, of, a, an, of urban development for a given year, current or past, uh, is what you're seeing in purple here, just diagrammatically. Uh, it's not about UGBA. To get to that UGBA shape, um, that, that orange, you would have to add in uh, what's shown up here in green, which is really about future urban growth. Um, the difference is the, the purple, the extent of urban development, is what's observable by Dr. Cog's staff um, using the board adopted uh, rules uh, to make that definition and determination. Uh, really the only way to see what's, what's in the green, that future urban growth, is in plans about growth. It's not observable in data sets or on the ground. Uh, from here on out, uh, for, for this analysis, um, we're just looking at the extent of urban development. We're not looking forward to the green. Um, one of uh, staff's tasks here is um, to take a look um, using the adopted classification system and make periodic observations. Uh, the first was for 2006, um, but we want to see how that extent has grown and changed by taking another observation, and, the, and uh, we have some data for that using um, 20, 2015 data as inputs. So in terms of how big um, this, this new footprint is, um, our extent is now um, on a preliminary basis what we think up to be about 757 square miles. Um, the last time this came up, as Brad mentioned, um, this number was requested, and, and we've worked with local staff to help us address some of the issues with the model that we actually use to implement um, the adopted development classification system. Uh, those, those fixes that we've been able to put in place in the model haven't actually been adopted yet, but they are represented in this analysis here. Um, the other missing piece, why we still call this preliminary, is that um, we do rely on local review. Um, we're showing a range because we, we have some uncertainty on either side of this number, but we're pretty confident that it falls within about 39 square miles on either side uh, of this uh, 757 number. Um, but local review can be a time-consuming task, so we just want to make sure 
um, that we have the right system and model in place uh, before we go through that process so they, the, the, the local staff really only has to go through that once. Uh, what does this mean in terms of our growth? Um, um, our 2006 um, observation was about 730 square miles. Our extent grew at about three square miles per year. Uh, Metrovision 2035 planned for an annual change of about nine square miles. Um, so keep in mind that this, this period does encompass uh, the greatest global recession since World War II. Uh, but still, I, I think it is important to keep in mind that the growth expe expectations can change um, over the course of an initiative or plan, and that's, that's definitely what we've seen over the life of the UGBA. Um, this kind of analysis does obscure um, some of what's happening in terms of the, the growth in terms of jobs and housing. Um, just looking at housing here, um, a closer look will reveal that significant development has happened in areas that were already a part of the 2006 extent of urban development. Um, don't think of this extent uh, as we observed it in 2006. It wasn't full or built out. Um, our development classification system has to draw a line around what it thinks that footprint should be, and it has to make some hard distinctions and choices, um, and, but the real world really isn't that hard and fast. Um, and so. Um, Imagine what you're seeing here is just a sample, a subset of the region, and we can add in um, the, the growth uh, in terms of housing units that we've seen. Nearly nine out of 10 of the housing units we've added between 2006 and 2015 happened inside um, the, this purple extent uh, of urban development that we observed in 2006. Just under one um, in 10 helped actually push that area out into what we've observed um, as new areas with that 2015 um, uh, preliminary run. Uh, turning attention to the non-residential side of growth, um, it's a little harder because unlike housing, um, individual jobs aren't time stamped uh, in the same way. Um, so we end up looking at change and so, uh, or growth and, and we split up the region into um, specific parts to try and tell that story and so uh, you can look at that growth in, in, in a couple different ways. Um, one way that's pretty instructive is to look at um, how much did a given part of the region uh, contribute to the overall share of the region's growth. In other words, uh, um, you know, what you're seeing in that middle column there of the share. Um, alternatively, you can look at, at how fast this piece grew uh, relative to where it started its growth rate. Uh, so we picked an arbitrary point in Denver's CBD um, and broke the region up into different bands based on distance around that point. Um, and you can see here that a majority of the job growth occurred between about 5 and 20 miles uh, from Union Station. So at first glance, this looks like it's about potentially a decentralization of jobs. Um, but what we're actually seeing um, when we went through an exercise um, to try and nuance this story of decentralization by identifying some example job concentrations. We're not a region that just has one major employment center. Um, some of the comments we heard back in March uh, uh, were about business location decisions and suitability and many of these concentrations are places where our region has been working to connect uh, with significant transportation investments. Um, there's a wide range of types of concentrations here. Uh, and many we probably didn't include. Um, some of the smaller ones are an interesting part of the story, um, although not a big part of the share. Um, they do have show a high growth rate and some of the different things that are happening throughout the region. Altogether, just these example employment concentrations that we identified um, make up about 40% of the job growth in the region between 2009 and 2014. Um, there are always going to be certain types of jobs that are spread throughout the region uh, just by their nature, retail, personal services. Other types of jobs are harder to concentrate um, also because of their nature, certain warehousing, distribution, manufacturing. Um, so these concentrations do p tell a large part of our story but not necessarily all of it about where we're growing. Could you, um, with that chart, um, not necessarily tonight, but um, 
add to it um, the numbers because some of those percentages are off of very low bases? Yes. That's a good point. And we, we do have um, a, a data-driven story up on our website on, on driver that takes a look at these employment concentrations as well and probably has a lot more of that detail as well. Um, so to try and sum up some of these recent trends and, and um, maybe asking ourselves the question about which of these trends might last, um, multifamily construction, uh, as we saw early, earlier in the slides, has a, a significant share of our housing growth. Um, here and nationally, uh, home ownership levels have returned to levels more in line with um, their historic patterns uh, rather than uh, some of the peaks that were associated with the lending practices of the early and mid-2000s. Um, so things like this might be contributing to this trend, among other factors. Um, uh, an interesting point about what might look like greenfield development, some of our analyses, um, especially with the extent of urban development as was observed in 2006. Um, there's still a lot of activity in subdivisions um, um, that were platted um, prior to the Great Recession. Um, so these things can look like greenfield um, development and often are uh, looking like development in places where um, they haven't been previously developed. But um, there are many parts of our region that are still working through a lot of that, that subdivision activity capacity, um, whether it's by design, the phasing plan, or by just a delay in demand. Um, infill and redevelopment uh, is something that we glossed over as we were talking about um, that 2006 extent of urban development. Um, a lot of the capacity that we have for job and population growth comes out of areas um, that don't look like they're new or greenfield development areas. Um, brownfield is probably a term you're familiar with related to cleanup and, and remediation and reuse of properties. Um, but grayfield is a similar term, and, but it has more to do with the lifespan of a given building. Um, our buildings are, are really seen as depreciable assets, and they have some sort of lifespan. And the chart that's on the right there just has some different building types from retail on the left um, to our homes on the right, and um, just the varying length of the lifespan of some of these uh, buildings. Um, at the same time as these assets are depreciating, the land under them is appreciating. And so at some point, uh, they'll need some sort of significant reinvestment um, either to repurpose them or they'll be demolished to make way for new structures. Um, so, so this is where we have a lot of capacity in our region as well that gets missed a lot of times when we're talking about uh, urban footprint and extent of urban development and, and where we're actually growing. Uh, we may also have... Um, lots of sites uh, that have been uh, previously been seen as maybe too small for the scale of development that was desired in past, in past booms, but are maybe now seen as less risky, or maybe they're better connected to opportunities, and so um, they're good opportunities for infill development as well. And job polycentralization uh, is the point that I, I was just trying to make on the last slide, that it just makes sense for certain types of jobs to cluster or, or agglomerate um, and, and these concentrations or centers are places that employers uh, may actually continue to look to because they are proven places, um, it, well positioned in the job market, uh, and many are well connected. Uh, commercial developers may also continue to see these places uh, as a, a good opportunity despite higher land costs than sort of the random greenfield alternative um, because there is a proven market in these places. Uh, and there are existing infrastructure improvements that may only need some incremental uh, investments in, in order to, to, to unlock uh, new capacity. Um, yes, do you have any themes for where these polycentralization locations occur? I just had to say that word. <laughs> well, thanks. Any themes for? For where, where they happen to be. They, um, they happen, they, there happen to be a number of centers um, do they share any common attributes or themes that you can identify? Um, they're, they're all over the place in terms of, I, I think there's maybe some themes within them, but I think um, some of it's just history of where there's so capacity at any given time. So it's not, it's not like time. frat houses or no. something like that? that <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, got it. Um, 
So I, I think um, before, this is really the last slide we have before moving into um, more of the guidance and discussion section. Uh, but I wanted to make sure um, to answer if there were any questions or reactions um, to, to this material as well. Any comments or questions at this point? Okay, sir. Thank you. All right. Brad, you're back. Yep. So now we want to hear from you. Um, we've got one. Miss Kanish. Sure, I'll, I'll take a crack and Annie can kick me if I've done it wrong. So, um, you know, really what, what MetroVision 2035 did, it, is it, it set a future urban growth boundary total of 980 square miles, right? Um, and growth from 2006 forward, we anticipated we would grow, we would, have, we would be growing nine square miles per year between 2006 and 2035 to hit that number. And our analysis has showed over the last decade we've been growing at about basically a third of that rate. Other comments or questions? All right, get ready to play with your clickers. Yeah, so I will, we are using clickers, so if you do not have a clicker in front of you, please raise your hand and Derek will scurry to bring one to you, otherwise I think we're probably good. Um, so we really want to hear from you very much. Uh, the one thing I will obviously make it very clear, this, this is not a binding vote. We don't vote at work sessions, but this is important to give us a little bit of um, guidance to help us kind of, again, understand where we might um, uh, you know, work with uh, stakeholders or maybe bring something back to you that really hits the, hits the mark of, in terms of what you tell us tonight and what you told us uh, previously um, in March. Um, the one thing I want to absolutely make very clear is that this is guidance in addition to what's in MetroVision, right? MetroVision makes it very clear based on the conversation that this body had for many, many years about what the expectations are of, of how we will collectively think about growth management in this region. We are simply trying to use the conversation in March and the conversation today to round out that a little bit so that we have a really fresh feel of really kind of, again, where the board is ultimately going to land in terms of how they evaluate what this, what this program or initiative lo would look, feel, and act like um, going forward. So the plan very clearly makes it, um, uh, clearly says to us as staff that is, along with the board and, and, and staff from around um, the region, um, that we will be focusing on uh, making sure that new urban development happens in an orderly and compact fashion uh, within regionally designated growth areas. So we, we have that as the beginning, but that's only gets us so far, right? We're trying to learn a little bit more so that we can make sure that we deliver, again, an initiative that really does meet uh, the needs of the board, um, uh, our needs as Dr. Cog staff, because we oftentimes rely on this uh, work to make our work better, but also your local communities and your, the growth aspirations that you have um, at home. Uh, so again, not a formal or, or, or uh, binding vote. If you have not used these before, uh, they will register your last vote. Uh, in each case, you actually are going to have the option to select more than one thing. The first slide will come up. You actually can pick your three highest priorities. It's going to count your last three. So if you vote, if you pick three things, you're like, oh, actually, I meant this other one. It's going to it's going to catalog um, the last three. So in the first, so just remember that you have multiple things that you could vote for um, each time. Um, I'll explain um, a little bit about um, how we're going to handle this for folks on the phone here in a second. Um, we also have, uh, we're going to pause and have discussion time as well after kind of each section. Um, you'll see that there is a, there's a, there's a question that's really kind of about the overall purpose of the initiative. There's a, there's a series of questions about, okay, what does success look like locally? What does it look like regionally? There's a se series of questions related to kind of what are the role, what are the roles of the board, local staff, Dr. Cog staff, that sort of thing. Once we've had those conversations, we want to hear from you in discussion because the polling is, is obviously it's it's imperfect in the sense of gather getting um, input from you all. Um, we're putting words on the page that are a reasonable approximation of what we want you to get your feedback on, but we really just kind of want um, your gut reaction. So we will have time for you to say um, your feelings on this, provide context, that sort of thing. So don't think that we're simply living on the polling uh, piece. We really want to do hear from you um, in discussion as well. So I would quickly also instruct folks. Um, that maybe on on the phone, 
Um, really, everyone's going to be voting, uh, ultimately entering a number that will correspond to the number on the slide. If you're on the phone, just simply use the chat box and send us what your votes would be. If you, if you like 1, 3, and 5, send 1, 3, and 5 via the chat box. And Tim Feld, our trustee uh, uh, fellow that runs uh, the remote version of this, he will make sure and catalog those using a clicker. So you are, you are not out of the conversation if you're on the phone, both from a discussion standpoint as well as um, using the clickers. Does everyone reasonably understand where we're headed for the next few minutes? Cool. Thank you. Just FYI, from the phone's perspective, somehow I got kicked out of the chat, so uh, don't worry about me. I'm trying to get logged back in, but I will participate via chat. Perfect. Sounds good. So first question, um, again, this is kind of looking at the sort of overall purpose of the initiative, and you can pick three, so you can hit three numbers. Um, on this, so what should the primary purpose of a regional growth management initiative be? Um, and I will admit that some of these sound pretty similar, but I'm just I'm looking for for gut reaction again to kind of give us some some guidepost um, to aim for. So I'll give you a, a few minutes to read through the long list and to obviously make your choices. Can we vote now? Yeah, yes, please vote now. Your the the polling uh, place is open. We've already got 12 responses. You can see it. <laughs> Given that people are making multiple choices, my main visual cue is people looking up. So just <laughs> thank you, Ashley, for looking all the way up. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and call the question, and we'll just go ahead and see kind of what the results are here. And of course, hope it works. Uh, so you can see a lot, a lot of sort of answers across. And just so you know, we will save this, and it's helpful for us. Um, a lot of folks. The two highest were uh, number two, preserving open land, um, and number five, which is help focus future infrastructure investments. But obviously, we heard um, other um, uh, perspectives as well. And just so you know, I mean, this, this, the idea of this initiative is it will hit multiple focus areas. So this is just to get a sense as to what seems most important uh, to this body um, as you sit where you sit um, today. So any feedback, response to that question, tell the group why, how you voted, if you wanted to say that, why you voted that way, any context that you want to provide to kind of round out um, that piece of input. The floor is yours to give us feedback. Oh, well, you had, you had three, you could have picked three, and so the 17% of people selected at least whatever that, the one that, uh, yeah. Oh, so the third one uh, in this case was number six, uh, which is help take advantage of existing infrastructure uh, with available capacity. Those are the top three things that, 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 that came from the, um, obviously, the first vote. So thank you, Commissioner. Brad, if you're looking for some comments, um, it's uh, uh, interesting that one of the, uh, it, and it was the lowest response, was number three, uh, which seems to say this is how you grow. Uh, and uh, I thought uh, my reaction to some of that is we've shied away from telling folks uh, anything other than your local option and how you actually hit that form. Uh, so that would be the connotation, at least, that I took of that. And it seemed to have a low response or lowest response given that. Other comments? Ms. Jones. This is a lot less scientific. I didn't vote for three because it's in the definition of what it is and therefore felt redundant. And to the degree that we were fleshing out what that meant, it seemed redundant to make it one of the primary purposes. So it was I, it was a different interpretation, and that's why I, I didn't put it up there, because I thought it was in, implied. I, I will add, those are exactly the type of comments we're looking for when we pause, just again, so we can hear a little feedback and talk context from you all. That's very helpful. So I think we had John over here. Mr. John. Zayak. Thank you, Mr. Herb Atchison. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, my my selections were uh, kind of along the lines with Director Cernanic. Um, you know, to me, I I selected the ones that were more supportive in nature. Um, you know, I I don't want to be telling somebody else how to grow and where to grow. I I want uh, Dr. Cog to be more of a a record keeper uh, of of growth and not not a judge to say you can or you can't do something because. I think we each have different priorities and we're going to grow differently. So for me, it's it's more of a supportive type of uh, selection. Other comments, more feedback? Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. So the polling is open, but I'll go ahead and, and read everything um, to you, not all one through seven. But so these are two slides that are really kind of paired together. So what would this initiative help do regionally, sort of putting uh, your regional ha hat on, but then we're, we will have a sort of follow-up slide that kind of maybe what's the what's the benefit locally that should be accrued from uh, thinking collectively about growth management in the region. So, uh, in this case, you can pick two versus three. So we're now down to two selections. I'm feeling like people are done, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the results. Uh, so you can see, obviously, we have folks um, uh, answer or select each of them, but really, looks by, by far, at least in this instance, um, number six is really what people gravitated towards, uh, which is maximize the benefits of growth and minimize potential negative effects. Um, you'll also see the second, the second most popular choice was um, number four. Um, which is sub-regional collaboration and coordination, right? Again, sort of understanding both at the regional level, but also maybe sub-regional that maybe feels a little bit more closer to home, um, really kind of where people are growing, how they plan to grow, um, that sort of thing. So that's really kind of the, the regional um, uh, values in terms of what we would hope this thing would, would try um, and accomplish. Um, I'm happy to just, if it's easier to chat about this one independently, we can do that right now and then maybe have a separate chat after the sort of more local um, one. And Aaron, it looked like you might have something, so. Yeah, well, less on the specifics of this item, but just that, um, you know, clearly number six came out ahead. The others are a little clustered in the middle. I hope you guys don't take too much from differences of a vote or two and give that a big important ranking because I don't think it means too much when they're kind of clustered together. I'll just throw that out there. The feedback. Um, I picked number six, but I think it's a bit, um, um, what's I'm trying to say? It's, it's kind of what we're doing is exactly what number six is. Yeah. I mean, is um, I'm trying to think. What can I'm you turn to your say. mic on so it can hear it? Sorry, maybe I'm just not close to it. There you go. Number six seems like common sense. I think that's why it was picked. Other comments or feedback on this one? All right, Brad. Okay. So this is kind of the local side of the equation. Again, the idea is this is a shared initiative, both locally and regionally. So there needs to be um, conversations and benefits that come at the local level for engaging in this conversation. So here are some examples of, of things that maybe you would like to see emphasized in the design of uh, this initiative. And just, Joe, just so you know, we saw yours. We, you are now officially in the polling as well. Don't know if you want the new group to know that, but that is happening. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, everybody done? I think we're in good shape. Let's go ahead and see what the results say. So definitely a, um, a lean uh, towards numbers six and seven. Uh, so again, locally, uh, the hope is that this program will prepare our local communities uh, for longer term growth, including new urban development, and then sort of also understanding uh, the pot potential impacts of growth um, within your, your local community. 
Any thoughts for the group? Robin, go ahead. This, this might be evident since there were so few votes for them, but I found the word communicate just confusing in this context, okay. right? You, I mean, you communicate data to the in, initiative to, to map it or to define it, but the idea that the initiative itself is communicating something, yep. I mean, it's, I don't know, I, I, I just found that particular word communicate to be confusing to me, so that's partially why I didn't vote for any of those. Any other comments? Mr. Beacom. Um, when, I, when I read through this, it appeared that the first four were just fine-tuning things, and I think they should actually have been one item, because that's really what we're trying to do. But that's I mean, all oh, this this is helpful. I mean, just I mean, I we trust me. I I knew as we put these together, these were these were not perfect. I'm hoping it just sort of sparks um, conversation. So I'll just give you an idea from staff's perspective where those four communicate ones came from. The way that the initiative is set up right now, you largely are just sort of sharing with Dr. Cog. Um, your local growth aspirations. And there really isn't much sharing that happens outside of that, right? And I, I don't know, maybe that's good. Maybe that's what we're trying to do, but a, uh, is really, you know, the one that did kind of resonate here, despite kind of maybe the confusion around the word communicate, is this idea of communicating more directly with your neighboring jurisdictions about your growth aspirations. Our current initiative doesn't really do that in, 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 in a real way, or certainly it's muted um, in terms of what we view as success of that uh, initiative. So this is helpful to hear um, conversation on this. So. David's got a follow-up, I think. David, go ahead. It, I, I, I accept that, and I, I think it's a good explanation. But what I seem find is a shortfall right now is that we don't communicate with our neighbors and even the developers and stuff. We kind of play everything real close to the chest. And so I think the important thing to take away from this is that broadening the communication is more important than who we do it to. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, anyone else? Okay, uh, John. Thanks, Herb. Um, no, I mean, uh, Director Beacom, I, I, I'll, I'll kind of uh, grow on that. I, I, once Dr. Cog has all of our information, uh, my hope was that they would take it, uh, knit it together, uh, look at it, uh, and help each individual uh, municipality understand the potential growth impacts. And then if there are any issues, uh, to help bring us together uh, and, and say, hey, you know, your, your neighbor is not consistent with you and be almost advisors to the region once they have the information, once they see something that may, uh, may have fallen through the cracks if one municipality is not talking to another. So to me, my hope is that they can, they can sort of be an advisor to the region once they have the information and communicate to, to individual municipalities as well as the region as a whole. Okay, Mr. Beacom, go ahead. Um, you, you restate what I'd like to see for the conclusion. Just right now I see that we don't talk to our neighbors and everybody, and not everybody reads everything that comes out of Dr. Cog, so they don't know a clue of what's going on, even though it's very public. And that's why associating and, and maybe city councils talking to each other with neighbors and commissioners talking to each other, that, that feeling that we're in the same boat and we should talk to each other and that we're not enemies of each other. We may compete for things, but we're not enemies. I think that's a very important function that we're trying to accomplish. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next uh, set. These words were really hard to come up with, so please let's Go ahead and vote sort of what your gut reaction is, but let, we can have a conversation. This, um, this is really focusing on um, the three main actors in this conversation, um, Dr. Cog staff, the Dr. Cog board, and your local staff. So we're just sort of asking about what these would look like. So what are the top two words you would use to describe Dr. Cog staff's role 
uh, with the potential um, regional growth initiative. And again, you get to pick two. Okay, we'll go ahead and check out the results here. Uh, so just so that for, if you can't read, well, you probably can't read how, uh, the small type uh, there, but uh, that third uh, choice facilitator was that one that scored 33%, so um, you know, by far kind of the number one answer. And then the second two choices were um, analyst and uh, modeler. Um, I know these words were imperfect, so if anybody just wants to kind of give your feedback as to what staff's role at Dr. Cog should look and feel like with this sort of initiative, now is a great chance to, to hear a little bit of context from you. Mr. Rakowski. Tell me what your rationalization was to differentiate between librarian and accountant. Librarian and accountant. Do you have thoughts on, on that? I'm trying to re recall. Yeah, yeah, like We're has to do with the Dewey Ducks. I'm passing the buck. Watch it out. Handy, how do we come uh, up with this? <laughs> accountant's a term that we've used um, in, in reference to the, the past program. Um, doing a lot of tallying and adding and summing. And librarian is more of, I think, in our minds, it was collecting up local plans and, and, and being a resource, a repository of some of that information that people can check out. Thank you. Ms. Jones? I was just going to say that um, modeler and analyst, I think, are sort of roles that Dr. Cog unique, uniquely plays in terms of the deep staff expertise on looking at and modeling what are the different scenarios associated with growing at different rates and in different footprints and, and analyzing. I sort of, both of those things are, are, are related and I, I, I think that's something that Dr. Cog does that no one else does in the region, which is why I, I actually voted for modeler, but analyst I think falls in the same category. I mean, I, now that you said that, that's helpful for me to hear. It feels very much like the group was saying, facilitate a conversation that's maybe more qualitative in nature about where and how the region is going to grow, but then also understand the impacts. Bring your technical tools to the table to help both the region and, and individual communities understand what that, what impact that growth has. That's sort of how that's landing on me. So I see some head nods, so that's good. Ms. Ganesh, I got you, Laura. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that Elise um, brought up her interpretation of analyst because I, I didn't choose it because I thought of it as more mathematical kind of and I guess for me I was looking for the word like advisor right which is where you share with us that expertise and actual recommendations like what's the best practice on this what are the implications what are the risks so that deeper level so with that framing analyst feels really good to me I, I just um, that I was looking for a word like advisor or something which you know we make the decision but I appreciate it when the staff says here's the implications yep hey, miss Crispin I got you Rita uh, well I, I think you should have added cat herder <laughs> that's always that's a given but um, <laughs> from what I've observed and I don't know how it fits in here but the staff does a tremendous amount of the heavy lifting to make sure that the rest of us can make those decisions um, appropriately under federal and uh, whatever rules, other rules we're uh, bound by, and um, ha has made that a more efficient system. And I don't know how you define that, but I don't see it in there. Okay, Ms. Dozel. I like the words that involve more of a consultative role, you know, where you take the intelligence that's been gathered by the staff and actually help craft the solution. So anytime you say analyst, which is more and involves actually taking the number of the data and analyzing it and coming up with a conclusion of some kind, and then facilitator to me is one step below what I'd like to see, and I like consultant, that's what I chose, because I would like that information that's been crafted and put together and analyzed by Dr. Cog then to be part of, and the staff being part of, 
the decision of how to use that information. So anytime you get that one level up of expertise and including that expertise in the decision making process is better and facilitator is good, but I like to have the consultant, which they bring their expertise to the party, not just to facilitate what everybody else is talking about. Other comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dyack. Briefly, um, no, I'm, I'm in agreement. Uh, to me, I think, you know, I see Meter Reader, I know no one picked it, but, um, you know, at, at times it, it seems like we have an awful lot of data and we have an awful lot of expertise. And to me, um, if the question is asked, how can I help the region get better all the time from staff, um, I think that will lead you down a path to help uh, everybody in this region. And I would like to see that and not just have staff feel like they're just taking in information. Because I think once you get it, you can really uh, help us out. Okay. Last call. Comments? All right. Moving on. All right. Well, that one was about us. This one's about you. So these words probably will be even harder to sort of justify if these were the perfect words. But this is, tell us the top two words. Again, you've got two choices that you would use to describe the, the board's role um, and, again, sort of a collective and shared um, growth management initiative. Hey, everybody okay? All right, let's see what, we, see what you had to say. Uh, so the number one answer was number four, uh, sort of a representative, um, and then uh, a prover on the very um, right-hand side. Um, given this was about you, I would love to hear your perspective about a word that maybe would have worked better, uh, maybe why you selected the one that you did, anything that, again, helps us sort of round this out a little bit. Comments? Just from my perspective, I think number four being the representative, I think that's what we are doing. We're representing our, our various communities, counties, whatever, and that's part, I think that's one reason it came out as high as it did, because I think that's what we're down here for. Um, I didn't pick approver. I did put, I think mine was uh, balancer trying to find something that says, you know, if we have a disagreement, we, we work here to try to find equitable balance of trying to come to some level of agreement. So I don't know the approver is there because whatever we do doesn't necessarily get followed by the local group anyway. Ron. Director Atchison, I totally agree with your first comment on number four. Uh, I have a lot of trouble with approval other than internally go beyond uh, is beyond in my view the charter we have as Dr. Cog. Other comments on this? Ms. Jones. Um, I guess I, I'm worried in this question that the, the words screwed us up. I think it would appear just looking at that that people um, answered what is the role of a Dr. Cog board member period. We represent our jurisdictions and we approve policy. So I think the fact that people voted for approver is because we're going to have to approve whatever regional growth initiative we do. So I don't know if that's what you were looking at, looking for in this in terms of what is our role with regional growth. There's probably a different question than what is the role of a Dr. Cogmore board member more largely. So I'm not sure this question really answered what you were looking for. And the one, the one that's, that's, that's an interesting, I mean, again, anyone who's worked on surveys understands how hard it is to nail the question. Um, probably what I should have made very clear is this is after the initiative exists, right? This, this, this is once you have something and you are interacting within that initiative, however frequently the board either makes a decision or gives guidance to staff, what does that role look like versus sort of the, the, the moments leading up to the point where we have uh, an initiative that you would uh, approve or give staff guidance that yes, this is the direction you want to go. So really it's once this thing is off the ground, what does your role feel like? So let me ask, ask the group yeah. this. If you understand what Brad just said, would that change your votes 
for many of you on, let's say, your second choice? Can we rerun that? Yeah, we can repull. All right, I'm going to let Brad clear that one. And actually, with right. that definition, that Remember clarification, Randy. would you like to go back and revote? I've got it. I think it's open. Go for it. And you can still pick two choices. Hopefully, this won't throw us completely uh, a curveball. But if it does, that's fine. I'm glad that you have a better understanding of what we're trying to get out here. My guess is this one probably went quicker than the last one, so I'll go ahead and um, see where we ended up. So just, I, it yeah. shifted more towards this idea of prioritizer as, as sort of uh, the descriptor, so that in a, hearing what you heard from, from us in the discussion, you, know, you shifted a little bit more in that direction. We'll, we'll understand that they both probably I would, you know, again, these aren't binding, but I think there was something instructive in both um, versions of, of the poll, so we'll definitely take that into consideration. Okay, everybody okay with the results on this one? Okay, Brad. So now we're going to go um, to two words that you would use to describe kind of the role of your staff. I mean, obviously for us, we want this to be the lightest but most impactful lift at both the regional and um, the local level. So what are some words that maybe come to mind in terms of descriptors that um, local staff's role would be within this initiative? Okay, everybody good? Okay. Uh, in case you can't sort of see the uh, uh, two most popular were reporter, so that number three, um, and then planner, which is the one all the way to the left, um, but also um, significant interest in sort of this term updater, uh, as well as collaborator and uh, user. Mr. Rakowski. I was looking for advisor and didn't find it. Okay. Okay. Other comments? Everybody okay with this one? All right, Brett. Well, that's really it. Uh, I just mostly want to mention where we anticipate this going next. Um, we really would like to take, um, again, the feedback that we've heard um, in various discussions with this group over the past few months, particularly um, uh, in March and this month, and we anticipate uh, bringing a group of, of your uh, technical experts and people that have a lot of institutional knowledge with the current program to sort of figure out how do we hit the mark um, with obviously the board of directors to make sure that we have uh, an initiative that really meets your needs. So I think we will probably work um, again with your staff for a few months and maybe come back when we feel like we have something to share and, and just hopefully we've hit um, the right mark and we, we will not be walking into the door in the door with a you know fully fleshed out proposal. It's just We'll, we will obviously check in when we feel like we have something that we feel like we need um, to get guidance um, from this group on. So we certainly appreciate you bearing with us and uh, taking a, a wild swing at the at the words that we put up in front of you that were, sh were surely imperfect. So we appreciate that. At the next meeting, at the May um, 17th meeting? Oh, the, oh, at the board? No, the full board, no. The expectation is that obviously the full board is invited here and uh, we have enough to go on and we'll, um, we'll use this again to, to, to get us to the next step to bring back to the work session. So, but thank you. Okay, moving on. Item number six. Mr. Rex, would you lead us in? Thank you, sir, very much. Before Steve uh, takes over the mic here and uh, presents the, uh, his topic, I want to yes. just talk to you about <laughs> what this is and where we're headed. We're really beginning to put the meat on the bones for the, the next TIP call for projects, which is a 2020 to 2023 TIP. Um, you know, you've seen some presentations, some information, concepts related to where we're headed, and we've got direction from you all to begin to, uh, you know, flush out those details in our TIP policy document. The two topics you're going to hear about, I should have first, um, uh, first mention this sheet that's at your table. This is kind of our schedule. And uh, the X's and O's that are in here uh, shows uh, um, when we anticipate taking certain topics to you all. It is extremely ambitious. So a, a kind of schedule is what? <laughs> well, it's fluid. But I will say we're kind of on schedule right now. Um, 
but I, I expect that you know if we could if we can follow the schedule to to the conclusion, it will be miraculous. But um, uh, we've already you know our last tip policy work group meeting was over three hours. I just heard the heavens open up. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So I wanted to draw your your attention to this and you know kind of use this as the guide as we go forth. So the two topics that we really have for you today are uh, the tip focus areas and just as a background on that. The uh, TIP Policy Work Group, or, or formerly known as the TIP, um, TIP Review Work Group, uh, they really felt that um, you know, we wanted some direction from the board for the next TIP call. What is it you all would like to accomplish with this pot of money that we have to increase and improve mobility in this region, to make life better? So we, in, we, in, we uh, encourage you all to you know, kind of select a few focus areas to kind of guide the uh, direction of, of the criteria and the selection of projects. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the regional, regional pot, the regional share, um, just lay out the framework. So with that, uh, I'll turn it to Steve to begin the discussion on the TIP focus areas. All righty. Thank you. And this is attachment C in your document. And we're Switching gears a little bit here and now talking about our transportation improvement program. Quick, we, quick reminder, um, we typically do calls for projects to allocate certain pots of federal dollars that Dr. Cog administers, you know, generally every four years, and we're going to be doing that uh, a year or so from now. And as was mentioned, the next four-year period of dollars are the fiscal year 2020 through 2023 20, dollars. So I just want to make sure we're all on that same transportation improvement program page. It's in a way, it's almost like a region-wide capital improvement program. You know, in a sense, you know, this, this is where we have the real dollars, the real money, and the the real projects. Um, so as noted uh, in the schedule there, and as uh, Doug alluded to, um, we're goal is to adopt the TIP by March of 2019. Um, the uh, key first large, very large item is the approval of the TIP policy document by the end of this year, and that's really, you know, the rules of the game as it, as it used to be called. We've got the TIP policy work group working on that. Um, they'll be looking at things like uh, eligibility of projects, evaluation criteria, and all of the, all of these things will come back to the board. So it's not going to be the work group, you know, defining the absolute. Everything will be coming uh, back to the board. Uh, as was mentioned, one of the uh, key things to remember also in the back of your mind as we're discussing this today and in the next few meetings is the, this dual selection process for this round of call for projects where um, there would be a regional share or pot of dollars to go towards regional type projects. That will be discussed later. And then smaller uh, sub-area uh, county-based uh, shares of money to go um, to the geographic areas of the counties uh, to recommend projects. So as was mentioned uh, by Doug earlier, a, a key component of the framework for the new TIP that was uh, discussed by the board in January, I believe, was the creation of focus areas uh, for the, the new TIP. Uh, the policy work group uh, discussed this in April. And as part of this, uh, they had us test a basis for starting the discussion. And I'm stressing today that the, our discussion today is not to define focus areas. It's to talk about some possible methods of starting that discussion. And so that's really, really uh, uh, important. Uh, key part of their uh, discussion of starting discussion of starting the discussion is using the Metro Vision plan objectives as one of the guiding uh, the basis for starting that uh, talk on focus areas areas there's a, a tiering of objectives within the Metro Vision plan that was adopted a few months ago there's the regional scale objectives uh, I forget how many there are of the 14 and there's a couple of A's and B's, so I think it adds up to 16 regional. Uh, but then there are uh, the supporting objectives that support each of those regional objectives. And then um, a third item that we did as part of a polling process that we did for the work group. Now, they didn't use clickers. They used, they used survey monkeys, so you know, they were able to do it from, from their office, is composite 
themes of objectives. So we packaged together some of the supporting objectives that some of them got redundant, some of them had common, common themes and, and packaged them together. And so we did administer a, a survey to the uh, work group. Um, all the members, 22 members, and I think 21 voted um, in the poll. And there were three sections to it, three questions that we asked them. First, we said, of the regional objectives, pick your top three. And we summed those up and tabulated those. Of the supporting objectives, which there are a lot more, I think there were a total of uh, like 25 that were related to transportation, pick your top five, we had them do. And then of these objective theme packages, um, they picked the top three. We tabulated the results. We presented them uh, in your uh, document, there. document there. And the work group discussed them. You know, it wasn't discussing them to define final focus areas, just to see what kind of things um, shook out of those results. And so what's presented in your packet is for question number one for the uh, work group was define your top uh, regional objectives and probably not surprisingly the ones most closely related to uh, transportation system um, rose to the top um, pretty pretty distinctly of uh, you know improving the region's multimodal transportation system and operating managing and maintaining it in a safe and re reliable fashion the second question I think it's a little smaller, can maybe try to enlarge this a little, but was for the supporting objectives. And here really, uh, the, you know, the top five didn't necessarily rise well above the others, but the group, when the work group discussed them, kind of identified, you know, these five as being you know, some that uh, moved uh, to the top of improving the system performance and reliability of the transportation system maintaining uh, that system in good condition and that's all aspects of the transportation system you know it's transit vehicles it's roadways it's bike paths uh, the third one down was in improving the capacity of the ro multimodal roadway system uh, and then the uh, the last two there were uh, bicycle and pedestrian accessibility and improving the comprehensive transit system and i'll just go to the last one and then we can check on observations here and then this was the one where we packaged together uh, the supporting objectives into themes and the two which the work group noted as uh, you know rising to the top were transportation system performance and multimodal enhancements so those were the two that they uh, uh, noted at you know the rows at the top there um, couple other quick things to mention um, before discussion is the uh, work group uh, realized that just as with the last survey um, and there's you know there's terminologies that people may have been defining differently in their head when they were taking this and one of the key ones that came out was uh, maintenance you know that's in a few of the objectives of what was really meant by that we're not going to have like a direct answer today and the work group's going to go back and look at that but Maintenance is one of those things that can mean a lot of different things. You know, if you're talking, you know, a roadway, it can be everything from your day-to-day -day snow plowing and pothole filling all the way up to, you know, a full reconstruction of tearing out the entire road, all the subsurface, and rebuilding the whole thing. So there's a lot of different uh, perspectives on maintenance. So we need to work with the work group and, you know, nail that definition down a little better. Another observation that they had was that to their, uh, you know, in their perception while answering uh, this, the, the poll, was that uh, many of them perceived that some topics were really embedded, you know, almost in everything, that, you know, safety is something that's going to be embedded in any, in any objective um, for the most part, that that's critical in environmental aspects, whether it's um, the physical uh, environment or the air or uh, you know environmental justice uh, type thing so that was that's something that we'll have to uh, discuss a little bit more and with this uh, as noted in the memo we really present a couple of questions to you you know to get your initial thoughts here um, you know first of all do you think this 
polling process that we did for this uh, method to help guide the start of the discussion of focus areas. What do you think of it, the process, and would you like the board to complete um, the poll? You know, we could do a, a survey monkey for the board members. You know, I don't know the specific dates, but just what do you think of the, the process of this as maybe being something to um, provide a little bit of base information? Uh, I think we'll just start with that one. All right, Mr. Roth. Any thoughts on the process? Yes and yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sinanik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, thanks, thanks for warning everyone, <laughs> Director Roth. Um, one is, um, as we've had quite a bit of discussion before, um, some of the objectives within Metro Vision are not transportation related per se, yet uh, it seemed among the work group uh, that the items that did bubble to the top, um, at least my observation is, um, that they're transportation related. So um, I, I think they actually recognized some of that. Um, the one um, piece that I would like to see is uh, we've talked about system-wide principles. We've had a consultant that's talked about those and saying that things can work well when you actually have those system-wide principles. Um, I'm wondering are there items that we have not included in MetroVision uh, that maybe other regions have included as system-wide principles that we should um, maybe take to kind of flavor this up a little bit and maybe focus some of those because uh, they may have gone through a cycle of practical application of those and I think that would be valuable to at least see or have researched. Okay, no, I, I, I like that. And then we can maybe think about whether actually bringing them in here or just discussing them you know, at the applicable time. Um, we'll think about that. We'll see what we discover in that. That's, that's a Mr. good Mr. Brockett. I had a question for you. It, how would you use this as a kickoff? Like, so, you know, there's some small differences in the number of votes that got received. What, what is it that you're taking from that as, as use, if you're using this as a kickoff? I'll almost put it put it back to you know first to the work group who had their discussion, and then to the board. You know, it's really a piece of information um, to see what things you observe in it. Different people interpret things in different <laughs> ways. I don't know that we would be wanting to you know, staff unless you tell us to you know draw specific conclusions, but it really is a a basis for just kicking off the discussion. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, how to specifically. Um, well, I, I guess to then to follow up based on your response there, I, I would say, like, I think that, like, the grouping of the items into themes is useful as a way to think about things going forward. But I'd, I'd hate to see our eventual tip, you know, distributing hundreds of millions of dollars based on you know, small differences in a poll taken in from a small group of people right here. So I, I would just caution you to not take too much from, from those rankings, um, uh, but, but, there, but there is some good material in there. Yeah, and that's actually a good, we can obviously come back to that first question, but that's a kind of a lead in like to that second question there is, is one thing we'll have to discuss further um, is there's a lot of different ways of incorporating when you ultimately define focus areas. And that is one of the key, I think it's still going to be one of the key discussion items at the board uh, workshop in August is the focus areas. And that after they're defined, it's how are they incorporated. You know, it's probably not going to be like a 100% split eligibility thing of, okay, only this is eligible and this isn't. Uh, we can bring it into criteria, into the selection. But there's different ways of bringing it, bringing it in, bringing the focus areas into the overall TIP policy, and that's what you'll help us with later in the year. And, it, and there's a lot of different places where, and methods for bringing the focus areas in. Okay, Ms. Kanich. Thank you. I got you, Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I like the idea of, you know, kicking off with MetroVision type uh, things. I think that's a really healthy starting point, so thumbs up on that. Um, I think my worry about the particular things that have been chosen, however, is that some of them are so broad as to not be useful, right? So, you know, 
improve and expand the region's multimodal transportation systems is so broad as to tell me virtually nothing about what I'm focusing on. And so I use the comparison. So, so one, I think if we are using Metrovision stuff, we have to use the lower level um, more specific right. things because these big level buckets are just too broad and what I meant was transit and what someone else meant is roads and they both fit and they're not you know um, so an example of where I'm not sure how to tease this out so 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 I think yes but lower level and then I think there probably are some things that don't flow as easily from the Metrovision um, pieces on the surface, but you can tie back. So I, I, I use, for example, we're debating our geo bond in Denver. And so there's a debate between maintaining existing and big catalytic, mm -hmm. right? Now, Metrovision has those words buried somewhere, but they're so discreet that I do think you probably want to pull on some other types of themes that maybe aren't as neatly coming from. So you might want to pull on the apples of Metrovision and maybe on some 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 oranges and um and I guess uh you know I think the other question becomes um a little so so I'll pause so that's second recommendation this third one just gets into a little bit of the um the overarching assumption so so for example one of the themes we've debated at this table in the past is the idea that Metrovision should leverage the fast tracks investment right that's a focus area now We've done that in part through this off the top set aside. So then it kind of became a less important focus area for the other decision making processes we went through. So I think when you, this gets a little bit into your second question of how do you use this focus area thing? Because, so I think that's an important focus area. It might be more applicable to a set aside thing, or it might be more applicable to it, you know. So, so I think that um, I don't know what you do with that dilemma, but I think it's relevant to you know when folks are thinking about this kind of polling. I think it's important that you maybe talk to us before it comes out in email. So, so think mostly about the set asides, you know, or maybe you even ask the question separately, thinking most about set asides, thinking most about typical, you know, uh, local project applications, thinking most about uh, the regional sub allocation, maybe because it'd be interesting to see if themes differ in those settings. I don't know. So I, I just do think, though, that there's a little bit of a, a dilemma of when, you know, chicken egg there. So, so that's a lot, but um, I think right direction, maybe some, some shorter more focused options, though, that aren't so um, broad. Okay, Shakti. Um, so you may remember that I was the most grouchy one when we passed this last time. Um, so I'm not quite sure how much to say and what's helpful. Um, I'll start out just with a direct question. Is it helpful to do these surveys in order to spur conversations? I definitely think the surveys can be helpful. In addition to sometimes there's only a few points difference, I think if you have repetitive stuff, mm -hmm. so you have three things that are similar and then the fourth thing gets a lot of votes, like it, it's confusing as to which one's more meaningful. The other thing is that in terms of conversation, um, it's if there's something we're really trying to decide or figure out, there's more impetus to to have a conversation, and then it, sometimes it's hard to know when we're talking to hear ourselves talk, saying opinions that maybe everybody sort of heard before, and when it's important for us to say those things. So I'm not sure to what extent these sort of um, interim step surveys really get the conversation that I don't know if you want or not. <laughs> that just, I mean, because clearly there's conversations we could have about urban growth boundaries here, but at some level we want to figure out how to do it so that it's um, only biting off a little part, but then how do you, so I do think it's an important tool, but I think it's a part of everything else. Um, in terms of the, um, So I don't know that we exactly what our last vote was. I remember we were moving forward on the possibility of using this other system. I don't remember it being that we necessarily will use this other system. And um, 
the way I'm hearing it is we're coming up with a criteria that will apply to all the counties. It looks like counties were saying no. There would be a I'm, different I'm, criteria in every county? I, well, I guess, I guess my, my concern is that we don't want to jump into criteria too quickly on this focus area thing. And that the focus area, the, how they're used is yet to be defined. And I know there's been people at the work group, too, who have brought up criteria, criteria. I, Doug, correct me if I'm so I guess wrong, all, that, all that I don't want to jump into that too quick. All I'd be adding, so the way I thought about, about it shifted a little bit. I used to think that, okay, this is like the Tier 2. Um, so these, re, these local allocations are like what used to be Tier 2. But that's not really true. The local allocations are like what used to be Tier 1 and Tier 2, and the regional allocation is like the, the set-aside the, um, off the top. So we're really looking at shifting all of our non-set-aside um, to this new system. And so to the extent that we're really weakening the criteria, and it didn't used to be just like three or four things. It was like, I mean, we spent months debating very in-depth criteria. We're moving away from a regional vision and towards um, uh, sort of spreading the peanut butter, which is important to spread the peanut butter with less of a... So anyway, I guess my vote would be keep it, I mean, more specific. Okay, Ms. Jones. So um, I think focus areas are important in guiding the tip. That's where the this iteration of the board will leave its stamp on the tip and will hopefully be based on the current circumstances in terms of what's regionally important. So I think it is, I, I, I want to highlight that I think focus areas are, uh, are critical to figure out. And I think it does make sense to start with Metro Vision. We put a lot of time into putting that together, so that makes sense. Um, I, I, I agree with uh, Director Brockett's comments about, you know, d uh, polling is a good place to start the conversation. Let's not over uh, overemphasize the results, but use it as a catalyst for a robust conversation. And I think I agree with Director Kanich about, you know, when we're polling on something where the terms are being interpreted differently by different people, we don't get a meaningful result. So the questions are important, like the, the point you brought up about maintenance. Is that road reconstruction? Is that snow plowing? And it, it, that's a fundamentally different question you'd be asking. So I, I, I think probably we need to be very careful about defining terms. And maybe it's to, to Director Kanich's point, be very specific in our questions and go to that more specific level as a place to really ferret out what what we want to emphasize. Okay, I got Mr. Partridge, Mr. Rex, and Mr. Teeter in that order. Mr. Partridge? Right. I think when we look at it, I think a, a, we all pretty much agree regionalism is a, a key thing for us all. I mean, why not? Who, who just stays in their own territory? I think 95% of the room did not stay in their territory right now. We're in Denver. Uh, so, but with that, you know, the high tide rises all ship. But if your ship is not able to get out of the dock, you don't have a chance to rise. And where I'm going with that was that sub-regional approach allows every ship to rise because it does give, it creates that equity formula. So with that, Steve, I think in a, in a way, I really look at there's almost two sets of questions. Would your, you would have a question in regard on what you would think would be a regional pot and then a qu set of questions for each director to think about in their region, their own subregion. So it's almost really kind of two sets of questions to really dive down, be respective of everybody's needs and desires, but really bring it back. We all care about regionalism. Mr. X. Thank you, sir, very much. And I do appreciate the comments we've had thus far. And um, you know, to, to the last comments from the commissioner, I, I think that kind of it's kind of on the same road that that uh, that Robin suggested. You know, about maybe maybe the focus areas are. You know, we have the three categories. We have the set asides, regional, and sub regional. Maybe there's focus areas for each of those. I mean, maybe we get that specific. Um, but I don't want us to get too so bogged down by the process. I think it's 
it's really, in my mind anyway, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm simple, but I think it's a simple question that what is it we would like to do to increase mobility in this region? Are there certain areas we should focus our investment to be able to do that? And, and maybe there's not. Maybe we, it, you know, it's a matter of just opening it up to any and all projects that are able to do that. And maybe that's sufficient, but at least there's a conscious discussion which, quite frankly, I don't believe happened the last tip go around. We were so concentrated and so just so obsessed with the criteria to make sure, you know, it is what it, what it ended up being that we forgot to ask the question what, what it is we were trying to do. And I think it, in my mind the question is that simple. I know the answer is never as simple as that, as that but, uh, but I, you know, and I think, and Steve mentioned this, that, um, you know, us as staff were very conscious, particularly about this focus area more than any other pro uh, part of this, of this tip development thus far, that we don't, you, we don't coax you down a certain direction. We really want you all to own this, own this part, so that we can begin then to build off of those focus areas or where you want to take this in developing out the criteria. And that's why, Steve has mentioned, we're not really ready to have a discussion about that specific criteria yet until such time that we feel, you know, that you guys feel comfortable with areas you would like to really develop out. Um, so I'll leave it at that. So he's dealing with 50 elected officials that he uses the word simple. <laughs> <laughs> Director Teeter. Uh, yes, I know he talked earlier on about um, multi-jurisdictions, and I think that needs to... Uh, be on that list right there at the top to where if we're going to be able to put a project on the board that will help three or four different regions or groups, uh, that's the one that I think, um, at least for our area, I think that'll work for our area very well. Okay, in the queue I have uh, Dyack, Walton, Shakti, and Shaw. Director Dyack. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so to me, uh, focus areas, uh, you know, I think, I think the regional discussion starts with the uh, set-aside. I mean, I think we can all look at I-25, I-70, and um, the light rail as, as transformative, I guess, as the TIP uh, committee calls them projects. So, I mean, to me, I, I think the discussion starts with that and what the attributes are. Um, and then we can move forward with what else. Um, you know, what do I want to accomplish? I think it kind of goes to what Director Partridge is saying. I mean, I, I think if, if we target specifically what each municipality wants to do and we try and put that, overlay that on the region, it's imperfect. I, I believe every, re, every municipality is different. They have different views on what's important. And um, to me, I want to improve um, each municipality increase local control so they can identify what, what their issues are and and fix them at, at their sub-regional level. And to me, it'll be interesting to see what, what transpires if that does happen because that'll be a true representation of what, what we need to in fact do. Director Walton. I'm new to this process, so forgive me if this is already built in, but um, something that keeps occurring to me is that um, different areas are in different life cycles of development. And so um, as I look at some of those polling questions, it starts to feel like icing on the cake and the cherry, um, but I want to make sure the cake's baked, so the basics, and make sure that's built in, and maybe that's in other areas. Director Shakti. Um, can I can I ask what the cake is? <laughs> what flavor? Cake. Well, well, Robin brought sprinkles to one board meeting about. I love sprinkles, ago. or are they Jimmy's? <laughs> um, I uh, just a basic intersection for traffic flow, and is you know I can think of one particular intersection um, in Lafayette that is important to me. Um. I, I just want to add that um, the process that is being proposed to add in terms of the regional, so the off the top, I think that's really great that we're looking at that. Um, in terms of 
um, should we give money to every city and they do what they want to do as a city or should we have some voice as a region on what makes sense? Um, some of that is making sure, I mean, some of it comes down to values, but some of it also comes down to um, bang for the buck. Like, are, is the money being spent on the best projects for the region? Um, so I think my position on that is clear, and, and, and I guess I would say that um, I panic every time we talk about this. Uh, in that I'm afraid that we'll come up with three meaningless general statements that every county has to follow kind of thing. And I, and the, what's valuable about that is it shows that um, I care what happens here, I'm invested in this process, and so I'm sorry if um, all we need is more time to work through all these issues. Um, the, the other thing I would add is that what I'm hearing from my staff, and my staff was pretty excited about this approach, um, is more concern that as they get go down the process of well how is the allocation really happen at the county and what criteria are used there and blah 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 it starts to seem more complicated and they're worried about um, um, is it going to be worth the extra work to set up this new system so I think that that's a question we need to, to keep on the table as we look at it I have director Shaw and then director Stolzman director Shaw Thanks. I, it's kind of funny, but I, I haven't been through this process before either, and I, I'm hearing some really good comments. It seems to me that it could be fairly simple, to Mr. X's point, um, and if we develop focus areas for each of the major buckets of money, um, we might be able to find criteria that that also fall under those focus areas so that perhaps a lot of the work has already been done by the board before um, letting us you know perhaps tweak as opposed to 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 redo um, i I like very much to have broad enough criteria that, at least in terms of the focus points or themes, so that areas, um, we know we're, we all have different needs uh, across our, our cities and towns. So if we get too specific, you know, we won't be able to accommodate a town or a city that's in a different area or level of development. Um, uh, who might be uh, or a part of town that's focused on freight trains uh, as opposed to safety as opposed to other types of uh, transportation like you know bicycling so it, it I, I I just want to make sure that in our focus areas we're fairly broad but in the criteria we try and and kind of slot in the criteria that's already been developed and and see how that works. So I have uh, Stolzman and Cernanek, but before that I just want to make one quick comment. Uh, for the folks that are talking about they haven't been through this process before, I just want everybody to keep in mind that since this happens as infrequently as it does, and we have the turnover that we do on this board, there's probably half of this board that has not been through this process before. Uh, maybe even more than that. It, th some years, this board, because of term limits and election cycles and everything else, there are some years that we have as much as 30% turnover in a year. So uh, first of all, I would just encourage you not to feel discouraged that you haven't been through the process and that you feel like you might be behind the eight ball with the information curve because that's not necessarily the case. And then secondly, I just wanted to also encourage that I think part of the reason that staff uh, wants to look at this with fresh eyes is because there are fresh eyes on the board. So, um, so just keep that in mind. That um, don't feel like the lone ranger. That you're th the only one that is looking at this and 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 uh, going through this for the first time. Director Stolzman. Thank you very much. So, Director Dyack mentioned the set aside piece, and part of my struggle with understanding what I think we should focus on with the focus areas is I don't have a really good feel for the set aside projects. 
um, and I don't have a good feel for the definition of a transformative project yet to understand what would be funded. So Director Dyack kind of talked about you just knew what those were, like I-70 and light rail. Um, but that raises questions for me. Like, does that mean the unfunded f portion of fast tracks is up in that pot? Does that mean um, other big projects that aren't totally funded are, are going to be submitted for that? So I don't totally understand what those are. And those projects could consume all of the funding. So I don't. And I heard a lot of interest in having more money go to the local projects. So on one hand, I think it's really good and important that we set aside the things for the transformative projects. But I, I just need more information to understand what that means to be able to be comfortable with the process, I guess. And I'm going to let Director Dyack address that. Yeah. Um, and, and So to me, I, I want to rely on the uh, TIP committee, uh, the technical people, to kind of take a look at that and provide uh, from a historical perspective, what those projects were. I mean, to me, what I've seen are projects such as I-25. Um, I, I, I don't know how, but I mean, to me, certain attributes that we funded certain projects in certain ways in the past, I, I think if you, if you create a list of what we've done in the past and what attributes we, we've had or that, that are common with each of those, I think that's a good starting point. So to me, um, that's what I'm looking at. Um, I think that, to me, those set-asides are, um, are the projects which are big. And um, the, the only two couple I've seen were, were the I-70 um, and um, the uh, light rail. So to me, I like the technical people to go and take a look at, historically speaking, what projects have we done? Um, what are the attributes or commonalities between each of those, um, as well as you know, from a funding standpoint, uh, what I've heard from staff is, you know, typically they were sort of last dollar; they were already funded, but last dollar. So, things like that, I think, are, are a good starting point with us to have a discussion or to have the technical people come to us and say, "Here's what we know," and oh, by the way, we're recommending something more or something different. So. Director Cernanek. Yes, um, being someone who's now going through this the third time, <laughs> uh, even though it hasn't been it hasn't been uh, all that frequent, um, I will be woefully disappointed and think we will do a disservice to the region if all we do is tweak. That's what we did the first time I went through. Last time, at best, we tweaked it. Um, Doug will remember him telling us, telling me personally, uh, that we couldn't do better because we were squeezed on time. And so if all we do is tweak it, um, it will be wrong. Uh, there are ways that we can go at this in a more enlightened fashion. Um, I use the, the term system principles, system-wide principles, um, for a reason. Uh, our next agenda item is actually talking about the relative pools between regional and sub-regional. I'll have some comments on that. Um, but um, to get to the point where we, we have that, recognizing we also need to be in a position where we'll break this down into actually measurable criteria, uh, but to start with the conversation so that we're not, um, pardon the illusion here, tangled in our underwear by thinking about our specific project uh, but we're actually thinking about what's going to be important for the region and to talk at that level and to have that discussion, uh, look for the work group on it. But uh, in the end, uh, we're the ones that need to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. Or, and um, I very much am looking forward to not doing something that's a mere tweak of what we've done before. I have Stolzman, then Pfeiffer. Director Stolzman. Thank you. Just the rest of my comment, and I apologize for making two rounds of comments. I just had a few other things. Um, so the um, I think it's important that the focus areas, and I think um, Director Shaw mentioned this, relate to the funding pool, so where there are specific funding sources uh, that have a targeted um, thing, like our air quality funding, we need, to, we need to have the focus area be about that. Uh, director, or I'm sorry, Mr. Rex said that he wasn't really ready to jump to metrics, but I, I feel that having some examples of metrics 
um, will help our discussion the next time around. And I understand the line of thought that, well, so from my perspective, we need to be responsible with the taxpayers' money, absolutely. And I understand the line of thought that the local electeds will have the best sense of what their area needs and will be able to take care of the money most responsibly. But I think at the same time, we need to be held accountable to certain things. And so that's where I think the metrics will come in so that we can demonstrate to one another that we've accomplished what we've tried to do. So I think it's um, important not to just submit projects and say in an amorphous way that it will have a benefit, but I think we actually need to quantify the benefit and then show once the project's completed that it did accomplish that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Director Pfeiffer, pull this hand back. Director Jones. I'm sorry, but I, the last two speakers just triggered this for me. I think the last tip cycle wasn't that we were disappointed with the outcome so much as we hated the process. And we might be disappointed with the outcome, but we don't know because, as Ashley pointed out, we don't measure the outcome. We never go back and see if our projects actually increased mobility, decreased congestion. So that is, I think, one of the flaws that we pointed out. And I don't know if we can accomplish that change, but to the degree that we could, that would be my aspiration. And it wouldn't be a tweak. It would be really getting serious about measuring the outcomes and seeing that we're getting the biggest bang for our buck. Director Pfeiffer found his voice. Well, I, I was just going to chime in because I came in at the last one right at the end. And, and if you all remember, I, I remember I sat. I sat right back there where Ashley is. And my, my eyeballs were spinning. And the only thing I could say was I thought this was a gladiator arena. <laughs> if you all remember that, that who was here, that's, I, I was so lost um, because I thought that we were becoming not regional, regionalized or collaborating or anything to that effect. And so the last three speakers, uh, I completely agree that we don't want to tweak it. We want to complete, I want to revamp it. I want a new approach because to me, I think we can do it better and do it more collaboratively. So. Uh, you know, I want to avoid the gladiator thing. That's that was just dreadful when I came in right in the middle of that. So, thanks. Other questions or comments? Right. Okay, this is an informational item. Um, so, other than taking down the information and the comments and the questions, I think that's all we need on that one. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. Um, just a point of order real quick. Typically, we have a hard stop at this meeting at 6 o'clock because we have a meeting that follows this one. The meeting that follows this one uh, was, was canceled for tonight. Um, however, we, you know, we can move as quickly or as, or as not so quickly as, as you would like. So we will move on to agenda item 7, which is attachment D. Mr. Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. And yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm going to make my first revision to our schedule. <laughs> I'm going to put an X in the box for a work session in June to uh, probably, you know, to, to finish this discussion about the regional framework. Maybe, maybe not. Well, I think it's going to be back in June or July to this, to this group, um, depending on how far we get with this today. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really do enjoy a lot of the comments we've had today because I think it speaks to exactly the reason why there were, were, there were communities that felt a little disenfranchised by the last process. I know when I came in, I came in right at the beginning of the TIP process, Bob, when it was, you know, I came in November 13 and the first meeting to talk about the TIP was November 13. And I was like, oh my word, I'm, I had to read the criteria, three, the last criteria, the criteria before the last three times before I could even understand it. And I swore I was never going through that again. It's 13. Yeah. Well, pretty much. But um, so, so then, you know, we went through our tip debrief, as you all know, and there were certain things that the board wanted to see. And one was kind of a simp simplification of the process, right? And I agree with, with uh, uh, Commissioner Jones's comments in that, uh, you know, it wasn't so much about the outcomes, because if you do look at the map, of projects that were were uh, were part of the last tip call, it's pretty darn good. You know, I mean, geographically, spatially, it looks good, and I think there was a good mix of projects um, as far as project types and all that kind of good thing. But I think the the process was you know was was just was brutal. 
Um, so I, you know, I think one one of the things that the, the Tip Policy Work as Group has been tasked with is providing a framework that um, that simplifies the process, but gets us in a gets us to a position where we're selecting the best projects. And the one that is under consideration right now is this whole dual model, right? The regional and sub-regional pots. So today, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the regional framework. And the, what we've developed thus far and what the work group is, is currently discussing and debating is about, you know, what should that call for projects look like, right? Um, you know, in the past, we've been pretty prescriptive about, you know, certain criteria. I mean, it, you know, points down to the, to the tenth of a point even in, in some cases. And um, what this... This process that we are currently discussing is more open-ended. Now, this, this is just for the regional pot, not the sub-regional pot, but for the regional pot. And um, so it, it's more open-ended. And uh, if I'll turn your attention, oh, thank you, Steve, very much. I'll turn your attention to, to, the, to the attachment of this item. Um, that, and basically, what we've outlined thus far is um, certain, certain categories. And we have the, the purpose and project eligibility. Um, the, the, actual, the actual purpose is, came directly out of the uh, TIP policy framework, the, the, the white papers that the, that the work group developed. And basically it says that projects are limited to transformative project, air quotes. We have not defined what that means yet, and we're hoping to get maybe a little bit of direction from you all about what you think that means. Um, uh, that play a, criti a crucial role in the shaping and sustaining and sustaining the future of individual cities and counties for, for the Dr. Cog region. And I won't, I won't get into it. You, know, you can read it as well as I can. And it's in, in, in your packet. But it does refer to the focus areas, but it does talk about projects that are transformative. But the important thing I'd like for you to, to notice in this section is the second paragraph, the one sentence there. Um, and it makes reference to all projects and program types are eligible. However, those pro successful applicants will be those that have projects that can show, again, air quotes, a magnitude of benefit that is fitting of a regional project. And again, we have not defined what that means, but it speaks to several of the comments that we've had here today that we want to be able to select projects that they can, quantify, they can, they can show quantifiable benefits. And a, and a return on investment. So we, we can prove to, to the public that we're spending our mo money on projects that we're gonna, going to have a, 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 a net benefit to this region. Um, so that's what I wanted to point out in there. And then the, the criteria elements, at least you know, some of the discussions that we're having thus far. First and foremost, we are going to request that the applicant, um, the applicant be able to uh, provide a, a problem statement. What problem is it you're trying to fix with the, your proposal? And if they can't do that, then they probably shouldn't even be submitting an application. And then secondly, and I would suggest the bulk of the points or the evaluation of this project will be based on, you know, the benefits of that proposed project. How is this project you are submitting going to alleviate or help reduce that problem that, you, that, that you've suggested? and uh, leave it up to the applicant to be able to do that. Now, what we'd like to get some direction from you all is, you know, and we understand we're going to have to establish some curbs on that, right? We just can't just throw it out. And, but they're going to have to be able to show us in a quantifiable manner how that project is going to solve that problem. And then, you know, the, the question then becomes is how do you evaluate projects against each other, right? Which is, I think, the most difficult portion of this, and, and uh, we'll be flushing that out in more details as we go forth. But, uh, you know, we, so we talk about the benefits of the project. We talk about, you know, it has to be able to, you, you know, the applicant has to show us how they're able to address the TIP focus areas, um, the consistency with Metro Vision and the long-range plan. We've talked about that in our white papers, which we believe is important, and the partnerships. And this gets back to several of the comments that we've had. It's like, you know, you know multi-jurisdictional projects or projects that, um, uh, you know, that, you know, big transformative projects that has a regional benefit, that will have a benefit to multiple jurisdictions. Those projects, I would suggest, would be looked upon more favorably than others. Um, 
and project readiness. We do believe that if someone is suggesting a project, it is a project they should be able to have constructed or fairly close to construction by the end of that TIF cycle. Um, so those are the concepts we're discussing right now. I just, we just wanted to throw this at you to see if we're on the right path. If you, um, as you can tell, I mean, it is certainly a lot more open-ended than anything that we've ever had, particularly the last two TIP calls, um, because it forces the applicant to make a determination if their project is fitting to be a regional project. And if they, dis they believe it is, then obviously, ultimately, we, you know, you all are going to be the deciding factors on, on if that project is in the, indeed regional. But um, um, I'll just leave it right there and just get your general reaction to this. If this is we're headed in the right direction, or you think, you know what, this is crazy. So, so I don't want to spend more than about two minutes on what happened in the past. But again, for the benefit of those who were not here. Um, basically, one of the frustrations I think a lot of directors had in the last TIP cycle was that we had project categories, and those project categories only competed against other like projects. So we had like bike pad, we had uh, we had studies, we had particular types of projects, and they only competed against projects within their same category. And the the frustration was that maybe the third project in one category that didn't get funded was a better project than the fifth project in another category and because of the mix of funding it did get funded. So that, that I think is one of the frustrations that people had and why uh, staff is looking at this as more of an open-ended approach rather than having those very strong definitions around them. Is that fair? I think that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, that is exactly the reason why. And um, you know we've had you know, we were so departmentalized or compartmentalized that we had project we had a project in particular that couldn't wouldn't even fit in any of the project types we had and we didn't even know what to do with it I mean that we shouldn't be in a situation in which that happens right I mean if that project has the potential to improve mobility in this region it should be considered and um, so okay in the queue I have Sir Anik Kanich Walton and Brockett and Jones and Shakti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to make two comments and hopefully be quiet at thereafter. So, um, one is the absolute importance of having a projected impact, but what I'd like to see and think we will benefit by is how that's going to be tempered to say uh, in the end that there's some consistency across the various different projects with regard that that aspect of tempering so we have some idea of the um, good sense that it's actually a pretty good projection of the impact that it's going to have second item is rather than measuring individual projects I'd like to see us take a look at the portfolio of projects for the regional allocation that's going to have the maximum impact for the region. Not one project against the other, but the portfolio of projects that's going to produce the best result for the region. Director Kanich. Thank you. Um, as we think about this handout, I, th I think we're in a good starting direction, so that feedback. Um, it maybe lends itself more to a menu of focus areas, right, rather than just one. And one of the, for example, scoring matrix could be, so let's say we had three focus areas, right, uh, leveraging fast track investment or last mile and maintenance. You know, I mean, you could, you could imagine a situation where, um, you know, you have a project that hits five of five or three of five, and that could be a more objective way of kind of saying how many of our focus areas does a project hit. So just a way to think about how to add some objective criteria, which, which may be easier to do if you don't have one focus area. Right. Um, the other thing that I think about, I think one of the things that's always challenging is, you know, the idea of reducing all projects to a super objective score, right? And, that, and, and I think one of the things that most of us probably do in most of our RFP processes that are, are you know, the, that this 
this system doesn't is interviews and presentations. And in theory, it was impracticable because you had dozens and dozens of projects. But if, if the theory is that there's a fewer number of qualifying projects, then one way to do a better job at qualitative, you know, things that can't be reduced to a score is to actually do what most of us do in other settings is see a project presentation and understand the project more fully. I mean, to date, we've been evaluating projects based on a score determined by staff, the jurisdiction they're in, and the name, right? I mean, we haven't had an understanding, right? So sometimes someone will tell us, well, that road project includes a bike lane, but I don't see a picture of the connection that has to the regional trail or, you know, I, so I guess I'm just curious whether or not there's a way, because I, I feel like what's risky and scary about this is adding this qualitative piece, but there are ways we've done that in processes before. So if we look at what are some of the best practices for doing qualitative work, it doesn't mean like, oh, that's a prettier presentation than that one, right? I still want there to be all these quantitative pieces, but it, it, and I like this portfolio idea, that the idea is that at the end of the day, if I'm not funding a single bike pred project, I'm probably not doing a full regional picture. Um, um, you know, so if there is a, you know, so if, if you have, you know, a set of things and there, and there isn't this, if, if there is a good applicant that meets these thresholds and has these outcomes, then, then I think about, I, I don't know. So, so I, I, I guess um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, in the benefits of the project proposal, I think that a piece of that, we want to point people to Metro Vision, right? So, you know, I think that's where we have a number of metrics, right? And so if I want to know if these metrics, you know, if, if you have five quantitative data that you can show me, but three of them c help with one of the goals sure. that I've adopted, I, I would be helpful to know that. So I would add pointing people in that direction. It doesn't mean it's the only kind of data they can provide, but it'd be silly not to point them in that direction. Yeah. Thanks. So in, in the queue, I've got Walton, Brockett, Jones, Shakti, Christman, Mr. X. Uh, just real quick on that. Yeah, I think that's tremendous. And I also would address um, um, Phil's comments, too, I, on the portfolio of co uh, projects. I really like that. We've talked about that, at least at the staff level, at the, for sub-regional projects. When they, when they submit their package of projects for the board's consideration, that they, that sh they should come in hand with an understanding, with being able to describe what the benefits of that package are. And I like this whole concept of portfolio. Um, Robin, on the um, um, oral presentations and the like, we have talked about that. And it's actually within one of our white papers, too. I really like that concept. And I hope that's something we can do. Because I think ultimately what we'd like to do, we'd like to be able to get to a point with the regional projects that the fear is that we're going to have you know, 100 projects, right? We've got to be able to, you know, there has to be some litmus test as to what is transformative and what's not. Um, so we can restrict the number of applications, so we can do that type of work. So we'll be talking more about that, and we'll, I'll bring that back to the, to the work group as well. Thank Director you, Walton. Under project readiness, I wanted to just call the attention to the vetted through a public process. I think that's really important, and one of the things I like most about that is it gets the public out of pulling out of the intersection from their neighborhood because of the new development and it gets them thinking regionally and I think there's I think probably everybody could benefit from more of that sure. thinking from the public um, and it doesn't look to be a requirement um, it's just more yes or no and so I'd be I'd be interested in making that either a requirement of the project or um, providing more information or more examples of what that might look like more than just a local plan or policy document but focus groups or whatever thank you director brockett hey thank you i have a few thoughts um one is uh, talking about the consistency with dr cog plans and getting to director kanich's point about having some kind of objective criteria or um, ways to ground this a little bit more one idea would be to ask people to show um, how their project will help the uh, metrics that we're tracking in MetroVision help us accomplish those goals because we have those really specific measures that we're trying to to move the needle on um, you know vehicle miles traveled and non SOV share and there's a bunch of them in there that have them um, describe how the project will help us 
uh, accomplish those goals that we're looking to, um, that we have in MetroVision. Um, so that's one thought. Um, another one, you would talk about the transformative projects that we want to encourage and what does that look like. Uh, you know, we might guide people um, by giving examples of previous projects that we think would qualify. And that, that could get a little tough because people have different visions of that. But, you know, if we provided 10 or 15 examples, it might help give, it, give people a little bit better of an idea of what we're looking for. Um, and then I think there's a, something that we have to be careful about this is striking the right balance in terms of the number of projects that we fund. Because, of course, the total funding that we have available is so far below what we could actually use um, that one single project could use up all of our funding, right, um, which I think would be a mistake. But at the same time, there might be 100 decent ones, you know, and then we would accomplish very little on each one of those. So we're going to have to think carefully about how to strike that balance. But one of the things we might think about would be a guideline of, you know, no single project um, would qualify for more than X percent of our total regional funding. So that's a concept to think about as we move forward. And then my last thought was just that um, Director Shernanik's idea of the basket of projects, looking at that as a totality, the way that I understood that was that as we're coming up with our final list of projects is to say, how do they complement each other, right? So we. Um, to keep that in mind. And so we can't ask an applicant to describe how they would complement other projects. But that's something for us to keep in mind. And as we develop criteria for which ones we accept, um, I really like that idea of thinking about how the final mix comes up with a complementary set of projects for the whole metro area. Thank you. Director Jones. So I agree with a whole lot of what's already been said. A couple of points. I, I do think having a mixture of quantitative and qualitative is really important. And yes, I agree that the, that metrics around um, how you're going to benefit the region, certainly some of the Metro Vision metrics would be highly appropriate. I think we should recognize that transformative can come in a lot of different flavors. Um, and I do think it's useful for us to collectively think of are there a set of regional projects that we all would agree from the past that were regionally transformative? So we're all sort of on the same page. But I would say that there's probably a diversity. It could be a single project like Central 70, which is, is at the core and highly used by people from all over the region. Or it could be a corridor project that unites multiple communities up and down a corridor. I'm, I'll speak to the one I know the best, the US 36 managed lane project, right? Um, so there's different ways. So I think it's useful to, to have a collective understanding about the diversity of that. I think it's important for us to make sure that we fund across the diversity to your category point. Um, I, I think that you know, it's useful to think. It's hard for a bike ped project to compete with a road capacity project. So if we don't want categories, then we have to think uh, about the diversity of projects across a portfolio. And if we can do that, I think that that works fine. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that as part of the uh, proving that you have some transformative benefit, you should be putting forth the metrics by which you will measure the success. And how will you know that the project was as successful as you're claiming it will be? So we really start a, cultural, a culture of measuring what success looks like. Um, and a couple other things. I, we're not really talking about percentages in different buckets. But I will say that um, I tend to think that this bucket is the most important because what is transformative for the region when we're thinking about our transportation system means that we'll probably get the greatest mobility benefits. And so in a finite resource uh, situation which we're in, I think that that probably should be the, the biggest bucket. And I know funding local projects is near and dear to our hearts, but I, I think as we explore the sub-regional allocation, we should start, start out smaller and see how that process works um, and put more dollars in the regional bucket to begin with. And um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Director Shakti. I just wanted to add that um, I think that the way that a lot of the large projects have been funded before is that um, CDOT or somebody shows up at the 11th hour and says we need this money right now 
and we don't get to like compare the different projects and think about where it could be effective and so just the fact that that we're doing this process I think is a huge improvement in that um, director Christman uh, speaking as a uh, smaller community with a um, weighted vote in essence thank you all um, uh, disproportionate to our population um, I do think that um, uh, director Cernanic's um, um, analogy or statement that we need to l look at a portfolio of what each um, at the end of the day what would benefit the region most because many uh, or I should speak for my own community we don't have a planning staff to assign for analysis of this we are relying on uh, this body to help make that decision to make a good vote so to have that type of uh, analysis would be good in addition to having what both Robin and everyone else was talking about which is the ability to um, uh, evaluate it so that the smaller communities can um, vote in a meaningful way I'm actually glad that you brought up the smaller communities because I was going to comment on that very thing that in in the way the the criterion and everything worked in the past um, you know quite frankly because you don't have a planning department and and you might not have a plethora of projects that are ready to go or whatever a lot of the smaller communities felt like they were bypassed and I think that if it's if it's looked at it as a more regional like you were just saying then then it's easier for you to go to your constituents and say listen we didn't get anything specific to us but this is going to help us get across town or you know whatever the other thing I wanted to mention and, and director can had to leave but um, she mentioned it first I believe and then several people added on the interview and presentation idea I think is a really good one um, I know in in the construction and development world that's a common thing that you don't just look at the number and and the the inclusions and exclusions on a scope letter you actually interview the project manager uh, so yeah, I think a, an interview and a presentation would be really good and again to D director Kanich's comment it's not going to be who's got the prettiest picture it's going to be who has the project that is, is ready to go and all that um, another thing that has happened in the past and it, it happens for a variety of reasons but when when uh, we talk about the project being ready to go there have been projects that got funding and didn't go for a year and didn't go for two years and so uh, that that is another level of frustration I think in this board is because people have long memories and they go wait a minute that project in XY community took money from I was the next one in line and they were voted more favorably than me and now it's 18 months out and they haven't started so that's I think that was another level of frustration other questions or comments Director Dosel. I have a conflict between where it says applications are limited to transformative projects and then it, the second paragraph is while all projects and program types are eligible. So if I, um, if you say to me you can only submit programs that are transformational, transformative, then I'm going to basically define every project that's submitted as transformative. Or do we rather have it that we want to focus on transformative projects and then define what that involves? Because I'll make sure that my project is definitely a transformative project yeah. if you're limiting it right. to transformative. No, it, no, it's it's definitely the latter. Um, and you caught that, yeah. That's. I'm not saying this needs some wordsmithing. There's no doubt. But yes, you're correct. Rita, you do a good job with that because you got an intersection over 36. That's very transformative for the region. <laughs> No, but that that no what what? Well, yeah, that's a, we did this collaboratively <laughs> between right. Louisville. So we already that's a transformative project that you can use. But I don't think that came out of this tip. That came through our own funding and uh, and CDOT. So we've shown how we can collaborate and work together, Louisville and Superior, even without the tip money. Yeah, I'm just sharing how creative you can be and innovative. Okay. I know. Thank you, but we're censoring you. Remember that. So. <laughs> Censoring or censuring? 
Same, yeah, kind of the same thing, just add a little sh to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for, thank you all. Very, this was tremendously helpful. Um, this was a great discussion. You never know where these things are going to go, but this was, this was really, uh, really good for us. And I think what I'm ta my takeaway from this is that, you know, we are headed in the right direction. And with, you know, some of the curves we talked about here today, so we'll bring something back to you hopefully next month, if not next month, the month after, related to this specific topic. So thank you very much. All right. Any final comments, questions, anything for the good of the cause? If not, at 614, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. There is no need to take your clicker home. They are worthless anywhere <laughs> other than here. So please just leave it where, you, where it lies right now. Thank you. Where?